going to move on now um, to uh, David Limbrick, who you all know. Love David Limbrick. Um, he's just, oh my gosh, he's been a hero in all of this. He's he's actually behind the scenes, you don't know, but behind the scenes he's really been helping me um, come up with campaign ideas. He's kind of like a mentor in a way. <laughs> Hope he doesn't mind me saying that. He doesn't know that, but um, yeah. Like, like he, the half <laughs> price Reggio campaign. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, David yes. Limbrick actually, before I did the, the Reggio campaign, he, he actually went to Parliament and brought that into Parliament. His idea was a pro rata situation, like yes. how many kilometres you drive. Um, you know, yes. I just thought that was a bit too complicated. That's why half I went price. for the half, half price. price but I'd already done the campaign and he was like, oh, I did that too. And I was like... Our video was better. Well, a he's a politician, video. not a filmer, so he needs to you call know, us, and he does he? really awesome. So, look, we're going to um, listen to David now. He's actually going to join us here, and we're going to talk about what he's going to bring to Parliament next Tuesday. So, we're here with David Limbrick. He's a Liberal Democrat, and my audience has grown to love you a lot, David. <laughs> Hope you're okay with that. <laughs> yeah. um, you saw him in Parliament last week. He's just been championing, championing for us this entire time, and I know that I appreciate it, and so mm. does all my audience. Mm. Um, you know, hasn't it been great, Matt? You've become basically, David, the champion. I mean, <laughs> when no one else is willing to stand up for things that are rational, rational and sensible, uh, you know, even things like my kids, my daughter is about to start kindergarten. She's four. Mm, mm. I, I'm, I'm only new to Melbourne. I'm worried she won't actually be able to go to school for the first six months to 12 months of her life. Mm. And so it was very interesting to hear from you the letters you've been getting of children that are affected by this lockdown. Mm. I mean, it's just been uh, shocking, some of the stories that we've heard. I mean, uh, since, the, uh, since the extension to the state of emergency legislation the other week, um, we've had thousands and thousands and thousands of emails, phone calls, messages on Facebook, all of that sort of thing. Mm. And a lot of people are concerned about the welfare of their children and other children. And some of the stories that we've heard have been things, you know, I mentioned some of these in my in my speech mm. in, in Parliament. So, you know, children who've stopped eating, um, they've become depressed, um, special needs children uh, who are only children. Um, you know, they don't have any friends. They haven't had contact with other kids for months. Mm. Um, we've heard stories of self-harm. We've heard all sorts of shocking, shocking stories. And, you know, even in my own family, I've got three boys myself. Mm. Um, you know, I see effects on them that it's really, really unhealthy. Um, but the most shocking thing about this entire episode is when I was at the... So I'm a member on the Public Accounts and Estimates Committee, yes. and that gives me the opportunity to um, question ministers and public servants and different groups about the actions and things that have happened in the government's response to the pandemic. But one of the things that was shocking to me is that schools were never shut down to protect children. Right. Uh, it's openly admitted by the education minister. Um, the schools were safe. They are safe. They remain to be safe for children. And the reason that they shut down the schools is to uh, lower overall movement and activity within the community. Right. Really? So they've got this... They can't model um, risk factors for individual activities, right? Yes. They, that was also um, discovered by me in, in, the, in the committee hearings. Yes. So the Cho himself said they can't model individual activity. So what they try and do is they lower overall activity within right. the communities. And that's the, that's the goal of a lot of these directions rather than, you know, you know, like there's a lot of complaints about, you know, golf and fishing. You yes. know, why is this yes. ban? Well, it's just part of lowering overall activity, right? Like the curfew, just squash everything. Yeah, although I've got different thoughts on that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but the... Um, the um, if you think about what that actually means... They've caused this great harm to children mm. across not just some children, like all children, yeah. right? An entire yes. generation yeah. of children for a benefit that they haven't really quantified very well. And I'm not convinced at all that they really understand the long-term harms that they're mm. causing here. So to my mind, there's this big moral question of they've made a decision to sacrifice the well-being of a generation of children without understanding the harms and without really quantifying the benefits or the plan out of this. I mean, you know, they've got this plan now, but we still don't even know what the end game is mm. with all of this. So um, I just think, you know, from a, a moral point of view, do we really want to be a society that sacrifices its children for mm. these flimsy... I mean, there hasn't been a debate on this mm. either, right? It's not yeah, like this true. is some socialised idea that um, everyone's discussed and debated and agrees mm. with. 
the very idea that we're sacrificing the well-being of children is hardly even known by anyone, right? So I, I feel very passionately about this, that we've made a very, very terrible mm. decision and that we need to stop it. And so what I want the government to do is to open up the schools to all children at the start of Term 4. And so to that effect, um, we're trying to uh, pressure the government. So we're doing that through what's called a motion. Mm. So for your viewers who might not know what a motion in Parliament is, um, it's a, a, a demand. And the demand basically states the facts, right? It states that the schools weren't uh, closed to benefit to protect children, they were closed to lower overall community activity, that closing the schools and switching to remote learning has caused harm to children, and that we uh, uh, call on the government to open the schools at the start of Term 4. Mm. So um, that motion will be debated next week, next Wednesday, in Parliament, uh, in, the, in the Legislative Council, in the Upper House. You know, even people that might have supported the state of emergency, uh, the, the emergency extensions... Um, may have second thoughts about, you know, schools. schools. So, so how broad do you think that the, that centre-ish portion who might have second thoughts on schools, how many are there? Because it seems there is a, a rusted-on supporter base for Dan who, you know, we're talking about the harms that have been done to children and, and they're not being measured up against the harms done by COVID, which is ignoring all of these harms. So... How, how do we get that message across? How, how do you get through to those people who are blindly supporting this? Look, I think, the, I think we, we, that we have to focus on is questioning the harms that they're causing, the right. long-term harms, and or the short-term harms as well, of course. But it's the government hasn't quantified this. Like, the harms that are being caused by their actions mm. don't form part of these models, mm -hmm. right? It's not like they're weighing things up. You know, and one of the one of the principles that um, they need to follow in order to you know, they've got human rights that they have to protect under the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. Now, under emergency situations, those rights can be limited. Mm. Okay, but in order for them to be limited, they need to be the limitations need to be time bound, which was one reason I didn't support the yes. extension of these emergency powers. But they also need to be justified and mm. proportionate. Right. Yes. Now. If you're going to justify harming that many children, mm. you better really understand those harms that you're causing and you re better really weigh it up against the benefits. Mm. And if you haven't done that, how can anyone claim that this is justified? I think it's just totally unjustifiable, right? They have it, even if you go for this, you know, brutal utilitarian mm -hmm. calculation, yes. which I, I don't, I wouldn't go for anyway, yes. but even if you did do that, mm. I, you know, I, I just don't see where they've where have they where have they shown what these harms are. I don't think they even know. We don't what know. Harms. I don't think they even know. No. They they acknowledge that harms exist, right? Because they're sure. throwing they're talking about children need to catch up. Yes. They're throwing all this money at mental yes. health. But really it's like it's like, you know, giving someone a tissue for a stab wound, right? It's it's just you know, all they're really doing is throwing all this money at yeah. all these extra services and hoping that they can fix it, which is a real feature of the way that they act. They have this sort of belief that all this amazing self-confidence that they can fix any problem through government mm -hmm. action and if they cause these harms that doesn't matter we'll just throw some money at it and we'll get some you know we'll expand the public service and we'll be able to fix it and mm -hmm. i don't think you can just fix things like that like mm -hmm. it just doesn't make yeah. sense you know when you've caused this horrible loneliness and and interruption to children's education their milestones their socialization in skill in socialization skills um you know, throwing money at it, like mm. maybe you can alleviate some of the harms, but it just doesn't seem reasonable to me at all, especially when they haven't calculated it. It was feeling very political more than reasonable. They're not, it's very political, these moves they're making. I mean, the people watching now are not interested in, in politics. They want their lives to go back to some kind of proportionality, as you say. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, I've noticed through the contacts that we've been getting is that, um, you know, we get politicians get contacts all the time from yeah. different groups, you know, from peak groups and lobby groups and all this sort of thing. But one of the things I've noticed is that 
very, very large number of the people that are contacting me have no interest in politics right. whatsoever, mm. right? These are people who are newly interested in politics because it's really affecting their lives, right? Yes. This, this authoritarian overreach has had a massive impact on their lives and they're questioning it. They're saying, yeah. why are we doing this, right? Mm. And a lot of them are saying, well, I don't support this, you know, is there another mm. approach? And anyone that's been questioning any of these things, the government's just come straight out yes. and demonised them. Yeah. Yes. They've said, well, why do you want to let it rip you're or right. something you're selfish. like this? Or you're selfish or you're insane or, yeah. or whatever. But uh, it's totally reasonable to question these things and it's also totally reasonable to ask if they've got the balance right. right. Like, and where they got the where they got the reason. Yeah, and how did they come to it. how did they come to these yes. decisions? Like we don't know. Like no. it's a mystery. I've been questioning about the harms Ever since I got onto PAYAC, I've been ask, asking about the harms over and over again. I've asked in Parliament, and I just don't feel like they've yeah. got a good handle on these yeah. harms at all. They're just sort of hoping that they can oh, fix it'll it. Be, it'll be okay. The, the, the thing that worries me the most is that the the um, the depression and the, the long-lasting effects on children, you can't really calculate that because we've never had lockdown before. We've never had this before. So even if you did try to put it into some sort of table or weight, it's totally uncalculatable. And it's well, take years as well. Well, here's the thing. Like, there are methods of calculating some of these things. So if, I've talked to some experts on okay. this topic. So they have uh, quality-adjusted life years, oh, right? Quality, so you, yes. Yeah, qualities, right? So you can... You, it's, it's rough modelling. It yes. doesn't take into account everything. But we know that um, mental health effects or mental, mental harm that's caused to children, mm. you can imagine if it causes some harm, that goes throughout their entire life. Yes. So the, the, the long-term effect oh. on our society oh is really, really, you know, it's yes. really magnified, yes. right? And yes. so causing that sort of harm to children ha has these really negative long-term long effects. And, mm. you know, there's, there's, there's people that can do these sort of calculations. Mm. In fact, we actually do it at a federal level for... Um, Maybe not so much for mental health, but for other things like um, our PBS scheme, yes, right? Yes. So they do those cal quality yes. calculations to figure out, um, you know, is it worth subsidising particular mm. medicines or not? Because, you know, you've got limited amount of money yeah. and you want to get your best bang for buck sure. with that money. And mm. so to do that, you figure out what's going to give you the best qualities or whatever it is that yeah. they use. Mm. But they do that sort of rational analysis to figure that out. But in this case, I, I don't feel like they've done any of that. So that's what that's what kind of encouraged you, obviously, to, to bring this motion to Parliament next week. Um, so, look, we're, we're going to support that. Um, RDA members are going to email the crossbenchers and we're going to do the best we can. I think it's a pretty obvious vote, but I, I, I wouldn't want to be here next week thinking we should have done something and we didn't. So let's we're going to get on board on mm. the website. You know, you can do that at reignitedemocracyaustralia.com.au. Now, one more thing before mm. we head off. I'll change the subject just a little bit. But, you know, we've got our roadmap... Um, this week, obviously, and the, the curfew's are still in place. And we also found out that the Cho or the police... Uh, Both of them. Neither of them actually um, even told the government to do the curfew. So what's your thoughts on that? Oh, look, I, th I think this is just totally outrageous what's happened with the curfew. I mean, th this curfew is one of the biggest restrictions on freedom of movement that we've ever seen in this state. Yes wasn't recommended or consulted about, like the Cho only just admitted on radio that it was just a, you know, ah, oh, if I reflect on it, maybe it had some benefit. Yes. The police weren't even consulted about it. They're just so blasé. I mean, this is typical mm. of their attitude to mm. individual rights. They're just so blasé about stomping on individual rights that they just do it without a second thought. Like something as massive as this as mm. well. Like it's just yeah. totally crazy. But the worst part is, is that, if you go and try and look at the science, and I recommend people at home, you know, have a look at the science around curfews. There was a study done back in, I think it was April, uh, by George Mason University. Just look it up, George Mason University curfews study or something. You'll be able to find it. There's a link to it on my Facebook page as well. Um, they studied the curfews in Saudi Arabia that, they, that Riyadh imposed on their population. They concluded that it actually increased infection rates. And the reason, wow. the reason for that, and this is what I suspected, and I actually said it on Twitter um, when the curfew first came in, um, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, but it seems a bit weird that you're compressing yes. all of the activities of people into a shorter time frame, yeah. right? Right. And that's okay. exactly what happened in Riyadh. Everyone went shopping at the same time, it increased infection yes. rates. And, and 
the Premier today was talking about, oh, well, you know, if you didn't have the curfew, you'd only be able to go to a, for a jog at 11 o'clock at that night was, or something. You can't go to Woolies at night. That, that was so terrible, he said that. It was, it was shocking. That, like, it's just such a disrespect for yes. the liberties of Victorians. And I know from my situation, I've spoken to lots of people like this, if, if Dad's out working at work, Mum's at home yes. stressed with the kids, yes. and my family did this, Dad gets home, looks after the kids for a while. Mum goes out and gets some me time, goes shopping, yes. all right? I mean, PM, one of the yes. few things that yes. she can do to yes. go out and get, do something by herself, gone. Yeah. And, like, just the blatant disregard for people's uh, freedoms like this is just outrageous. Like, they've got to get rid of the curfew as well. So I'm yeah, hoping that'll come up next week as yeah. well. Uh, fingers crossed the Libs will bring up something about the curfew, but uh, it'd be great if there's a lot of pressure to get rid of the curfew and get the kids back to school. I suspect that even though we're railing against a terrible government, I suspect deep down you're probably an optimist. The way I hear you speak in Parliament. I'm very yeah. much an optimist. <laughs> so yeah. I thought We're going to get through this. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I thought, I would, we'd, uh, hope if you don't mind, if we that. could hear from David... Where you see the light at the end of the tunnel? How we, uh, do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Are we going to get out of this? Because at the moment, yes. you're the only one who's really making sense to the housewives, to the mums, the people who talk to me are just centre of the road people. Where are we going? Are we going to survive? Today's Are You OK Day. How yeah. We, well, we, I'm not OK at the moment, but I'm, and I think lots of people aren't OK, yeah. but I'd like to instill a sense of hope to people that... We're probably at the peak of the restrictions right now. Therefore, it can only get better from here. That's my yeah. first point. Awesome. My second point is one of the things that I've uh, said for a long, long time, well before the pandemic, is that people who have lost their freedoms and liberties are the people that appreciate them the most, right? What I'm hoping, and this is, this is why I've engaged a lot with uh, refugee communities in Southeast Metro, because a lot of these people have escaped uh, authoritarian regimes. Yeah, of course. And they, they came here, they came to this country yeah. because of our freedom of speech, because of our freedom of religion, because of our freedom of movement, mm. assembly, all of these things, they cherish them, right? Mm. My hope for the future for Victoria is that now that everyone has lost their freedoms to some degree, that once we get them back and we at the moment that's our focus is to fight to get them back once we get them back people will jealously guard them more than they have ever done that's my hope Fantastic. i think so can i just i actually want to end on something really quickly when i was in ecuador you know in these south american countries it's very dictatorship style and they don't have a lot of freedom sometimes and it can be taken away very quickly a, a woman i really respect said to me you know when democracy is working correctly uh, people forget that it was mm. fought for and then mm -hmm. it had to be won, and they think, oh, we've just got it. But it's actually not a right. It's actually a privilege to, to, that you fought for. And so yeah. I think we need to remember that, that we need to continue to fight to keep democracy. When we get it back, it's a continuous fight, and yep. you're going to be on the front line of that yes. because you're thank a you. Liberal Democrat. So thank you so much. Yeah, um, as I said, the campaign's on the website. David's going to be in Parliament next week. We'll be watching you very closely because we really appreciate what you're doing. Um, and thank you so much for coming on board and speaking to us about everything.